Hello, welcome to Concept Hero. In this video, we are going to do a cross analysis of the current war in Ukraine with that of World War I and II. It is now 17 days since Russia's invasion of Ukraine with no sign of ceasefire despite sanction targeting Russian economy. Now, before we could jump into our analysis, let's do a fact check. Is the current Ukrainian-Russian war a world war? Definitely not. By definition, world war is a war that involves many countries. So we can rule out that the Ukrainian-Russian war is not a world war. In a few moments, we are going to find out what causes the First World War and how many countries were involved to warrant it being a world war. Two, we are also going to check and do a fact finding on the Second World War and why it was called World War and do a comparison with the current situation in Ukraine. World War I began after the assassination of Austrian Archduke Ferdinand by a 19-year-old boy, Gavrilo Princip, on June 28, 1914. His mother catapulted into a war across Europe that lasted until 1918. During the conflict, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, called the Central Powers, or the Triple Alliance. They fought against Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania, Japan, and the United States. They were known as Triple Intent, or the Allied Powers. This war just started by two countries with just one assassination and it pulled other countries into the conflict. Now let us dissect how the United States joined the World War I and what were the reason of it joining the war. During this conflict, the United States had decided to remain neutral. However, there were two important events that changed the public opinion towards American intervention. The first event was the sinking of the RMS Lusitania on May 7, 1915 by a German U-boat, U-20. Lusitania was a British ocean liner and its sinking contributed indirectly to the entry of the United States into the World War I. The second critical event influencing American public opinion towards intervention was the interception of the Zimmerman telegram and continued sinking of American ships. Before we continue to the second segment, if it is your first time on this channel, take a minute or two and click that subscribe button and notice bell so that if we make a video like this, YouTube will automatically notify you of our new video. On 1st September 1939, Germany invaded Poland. And on 3rd September 1939, Great Britain and France responded by declaring war on Germany. And this was the beginning of World War II. 
This conflict involved virtually every part of the world during the years between 1939 to 1945. And the principal belligerents were the Axis power, that is Germany, Italy, and Japan, against the Allies that included France, Great Britain, and the United States. The others were the Soviet Union and, to a lesser extent, China. This war was a continuation of the disputes that were never settled by World War I. This war is considered the most bloodiest and the largest in the world history. Before we go to our last segment, consider clicking the subscribe button and notification bell so that you will get a notification when we make a video like this. World War II came to an end when Germany surrenders on May 7th, 1945. And on 2nd September 1945, United States General Douglas MacArthur accepted formal surrender of Japan. And that was the end of World War II. On our two previous accounts, there are only two countries that are involved in a fight or in war, in both the accounts. Similarly, in the current war in Ukraine, there are only two countries which are fighting. That is Russia invading Ukraine. In World War I, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia after the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in 1914. In Second World War, Germany invades Poland and after three days, France and Great Britain joins the war and so many other countries joined the war. In the current conflict, we have seen countries take sides and this was evident during the United Nations General Assembly voting session where 145 countries voted in favor of Ukraine, five against, that means uh, in favor of Russia, and 35 abstained, meaning choosing a neutral position. We have also seen the president of Ukraine calling for a no-fly zone in the Ukrainian airspace, of which NATO has rejected the call. Have a look at this, then you can do a conclusion on this. What is taking place in Ukraine now is horrific. It's, uh, it's painful and we see human suffering, we see destruction at the scale we haven't seen in Europe since the Second World War. And I would like to commend the courage of the Ukrainian people standing up against the Russian invasion, standing up against uh, Putin's uh, forces. NATO is a defensive alliance. Our core task is to keep our 30 nations safe. 
We are not part of this conflict. And we have a responsibility to ensure it does not escalate and spread beyond Ukraine. Because that would be even more devastating and more dangerous. So uh, we have made it clear that we are not going to move into Ukraine, neither on the ground or in the Ukrainian airspace. And of course, the only way to implement a no-fly zone is to send NATO planes, fighter planes, into Ukrainian air airspace and then impose that no-fly zone by shooting down Russian planes. And our assessment is that uh, we understand the desperation, but we also believe that if we did that, we end up with something that could end in a full-fledged war in Europe, involving many more countries and uh, causing much more human suffering. With regard to uh, the no-fly zone, I think uh, you heard NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg speak to this uh, earlier today. One of the responsibilities we have, even as we are uh, doing everything we can to give the Ukrainian uh, people the means to defend themselves, effectively against Russia. We also have a responsibility, as the Secretary General said, to ensure that the war doesn't spill over even beyond Ukraine. Uh, and again, uh, because I think he, he, he put it so well, as he, as he noted, uh, the only way to actually implement something like a no-fly zone uh, is to send NATO planes into Ukrainian airspace and to shoot down Russian planes. And that uh, could lead to a full-fledged war um, in, uh, in Europe. President Biden has been clear that we, uh, are not going to get into a war with Russia. But we are uh, going to tremendous lengths with allies and partners to provide Ukrainians with uh, the means to, uh, to effectively defend themselves. And of course, we're seeing every single day their extraordinary heroism, uh, as well as um, very, uh, very real results in, um, in what they're doing to, to achieve that. NATO intelligence is well aware of the enemy's plans. They also confirmed that Russia wants to continue the offensive. How is that possible? For nine days we've seen fierce war. They're destroying our cities, shelling our people, our children, residential neighborhoods, churches, schools. They're destroying everything that allows us to live a normal life, a human life. And they want to continue. Knowing that new strikes and casualties are inevitable, NATO deliberately decided not to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Но любое движение в этом направлении будет нами рассматриваться как, э, как участие в вооруженном конфликте той страны, с территории которой будут создаваться угрозы для наших военнослужащих. Мы в эту же секунду будем рассматривать их как участниками военного конфликта. И уже все равно, какими там членами они являются. Это что такое денацификация? Вот я с коллегами с западными разговариваю. А чего такое? У вас тоже есть радикалы. Да, у нас есть. Но у нас нет в правительстве радикалов. И все признают, что там есть. Да, может быть, у нас есть какие-то придурки, которые со свастикой где-то бегают. Но разве мы поддерживаем это на, на правительственном уровне? Разве у нас ходят с факелами тысячи людей по столицам? We already know Putin's war against Ukraine will never be a victory. He hoped to dominate Ukraine without a fight. He failed. He hoped to fracture European resolve. He failed. He hoped to weaken the transatlantic alliance. He failed. He hoped to split apart American democracies in terms of our positions. He failed. The American people are united. The world is united. And we stand with the people of Ukraine. We will not let autocrats and would-be emperors dictate the direction of the world. Hello, welcome to our last segment on this analysis. If it is your first time on this channel, please consider clicking the subscribe button and the bell button so that if we make a video like this, YouTube will automatically notify you of our new videos. We have seen 
how the world is divided on the Russian Ukraine conflict. And I cannot rule out the possibility of a World War III based on these new developments that have been occurring since this conflict started. We have seen the President of the United States saying they will not fight a World War III in Ukraine. We have also seen the NATO Secretariat and the European Union Secretariat saying enforcement of a no-fly zone in the Ukrainian airspace will escalate the war and this can lead to a World War III. The Russian president also have warned NATO on enforcement of a no-fly zone in Ukraine and went further to put his nukes on high alert. That means they are being made ready for any further escalation. Based on these trends, we can conclude that the possibility of a World War III is imminent and that will involve nuclear war. Thank you for watching our video. Kindly click the subscribe button and a notification bell so that in our next video you will be automatically updated. You can also give a comment, a suggestion, and a thumbs up. Thank you.